And I want to welcome everyone to our next webinar. I'm going to get started with a few announcements as soon as I can get my window to stop jumping around. So uh, the UNO Chris Libraries Archives and Special Collections, which is our partner in the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary celebration and events, has a standing exhibit entitled Charting Our Path, Celebrating 50 Years of Black Studies, 1971 to 2021, on the first floor of Chris Library that features photographs and documents related to the Omaha 54, the founding of the department and its progress and challenges challenges over the past 50 years. The exhibit is open until August 31st. The library also has a traveling exhibit that is open at the Great Plains Black History Museum located in the Jewel Building at 2221 North 24th Street. This exhibit runs until April 1st. Due to COVID rate restrictions, access to the museum is by appointment only. To book an appointment, go to their website gpblackhistorymuseum.org. In addition to these exhibits, the library also has a digital collection of the items on display and more. The links to the digital archive, as well as pictures of the exhibit uh, can be found in the chat. And I will drop that in the chat shortly. In a related announcement, and also you can also find these at our website, the Black History 50th Anniversary website. Um, in a related announcement, and you can see the arrows, the Great Plains Black History Museum is hosting a monthly lunch and learn where there will be where they will be discussing the history of historically black colleges and universities. They will be held on the last Monday of every month except December, where it will be held on the third Monday. The next one will take place on Monday, February 28th at 12 o'clock Central Time. Registration is through Eventbrite. You can scan the QR code on this slide and you can see that later. Uh, the link will also be in the chat. And I'll do that once I stop sharing. And we're back. It's so good evening. My name is Deborah Hurd, and I am the project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And I would like to welcome you to today's lecture. As we come to the end of February, we want you to know that this is not a Black History Month event. We celebrate Black history all year long. When Carter G. Woodson established Negro History Week, his purpose was to not only counter the lie that Black people had no history by actually presenting that history, but also to use the week for Black people and Black organizations to reflect on what they had done and the contributions that they had made over the preceding year to benefit the Black community. This year, the Department of Black Studies has and is engaged in a 50-year retrospective of the department's birth, development, and growth as well as its obstacles, challenges, and battles as it looks to the future by creating new pathways, reaching new student populations, fostering new ideas, engaging new community partners, and generating new forms of knowledge to advance the discipline of Black studies and to benefit the local communities that are at the heart of this academic work. As we reflect, we honor the students whose sacrifice created this academic space. 54 black, brave black students who risked not only arrest, but their academic careers for change. The arrest of the Omaha 54 on November 10th, 1969 for sit-in protest in the president's office was a defining moment for the grassroots black student movements to move beyond UNO's campus and into Omaha's black community. Their arrest galvanized Omaha's Black civic, social, and religious organizations who worked together to bail out all 54 students and support them in their demands 
the UNO's administration to address the racial discrimination that they faced and to recognize the cultural relevance of all of its students. This included the call for the creation of a Department of Black Studies in Omaha, Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. It is because of their persistence for the next year and a half after their arrest that this department came into existence in the fall of 1971, making it one of the oldest Black Studies departments in the country and one of a very few in the entire Great Plains region. And it is because of the continued support of Omaha's Black community that this department continues to exist. We honor you and we thank you. As a discipline that studies, analyzes, and critiques the continuing effects of historical enslavement, colonization, land dispossession, and corporate imperialism, we cannot help but acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom this city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. Finally, we remember and we call the name Trayvon Martin. Saturday, February 26th, will mark 10 years since this teenager's life was taken. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his mother, his father, and his brother as they grieve anew, grieving not only the loss of a young life, but also their inability to receive any type of justice for that loss. We call his name because his name reminds us of the violence perpetuated against Black bodies that continues until this day. And it evokes the memory and spirits of those who have lost their lives, whose families lost sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, grandsons, granddaughters, cousins, whose friends lost companions and soulmates and whose communities lost vital, irre irreplaceable parts of their future. So we call the name Trayvon Martin because his name reminds us that the fight for fairness and the struggle for justice must continue. This violence in all its forms must end. Now, it is with great honor that I introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Don Yvette Curry. Dr. Curry is an Associate Professor of History and Ethnic Studies at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She earned a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Mary Washington, a master's in history from Ohio University, and a PhD in history from Michigan State University. Her dissertation research and continued work focuses on South African history and protest struggles. Her other specialties include 20th century African history, women and gender in African history, African colonial histories, comparative black histories, and oral history. Dr. Curry was a Fulbright Scholar to South Africa in 2017 to 2018, and is a founding member of the Nebraska chapter of the Fulbright Association. She is the author of two books. I share my screen again. Apartheid on the Black Isle, Removal and Resistance in Alexandria, South, uh, South Africa, and Social Justice at Apartheid's Dawn, African Women, Intellectuals, and the Quest to Save the Nation. She's also co-editor of Extending the Diaspora, New Histories of Black People. She serves as Senior Book Review Editor of the African Studies Review and review editor for the online research H Africa. Welcome, Dr. Curry. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. So before I turn it over to you, I have a couple of questions to uh, just get us involved and engaged. Uh, so what drew you to studying history and then focusing specifically on South African history? Well, as I was growing up, I was always curious about the American Civil Rights Movement. And, you know, I was fascinated by resistance. 
And I saw my mother one day when I was like five or six, stand up to a police officer because, because he put his finger in her face and she did not back down. So I wanted to understand how does resistance get manifested? So I started with the African, with African American history. And then as I was in college, the anti-apartheid movement was really booming in the eighties. You know, Nelson Mandela's name was evoked all over the world because of his wife, Winnie Mandela. She kept his name alive. And every time I went to take a class on Africa or African-American history, it conflicted with my Spanish classes. So I vowed that the next time I went to school, I would focus on Africa and that's what I did. And I took a master's class, the history of South Africa. And the professor was talking about bus boycotts in Alexandria, South Africa. Now, Alexandra is a black and colored, colored meant and mixed ancestry during the apartheid era township, nine miles northeast of Johannesburg. And he struck my interest because they had four bus boycotts in the 40s, 1940, 42, 43, and 44. And he kept talking about this woman named Lillian Shabalala. And then I read about her and I was like, oh my gosh, she wrote all this stuff in the newspapers. And this is, you know, what I draw upon in my, in my book, um, Social Justice at Apartheid Dawn. So that's how I got interested in. And also I took a class as a freshman with none other than James Farmer, you know, one of the co-founders of Congress of Racial Equality. And, you know, I read his autobiography, Lay Bed or Heart, but he also spoke so eloquently in class. And I got to take him home a couple of times too. So that just made my day. But he really got me into oral history and wanting to hear the voices of the marginalized, the subaltern, and, you know, the grassroots. And that's how I, I got into this foray. All right. Um, so who are some of the scholars in the field? And that can be Black historians or Black studies scholars in general that serve as role models or inspirations for you. First of all, I would say my role models come from two professors at Michigan State University where I got my PhD, and they were Dr. Darlene Clark Hine and Dr. Wilma King. And they not only taught me about professionalism, but I really got to understand how the history of Black people from the continent to the diasporas intersected. And so I would rank them very high, as well as Robin D.G. Kelly, whose book Race Revels, you know, uh, worked with the theory of James C. Scott, who was also very critical in my work, his Domination of Arts of Resistance, where he talks about how the dominant and subordinate create public and private transcripts away from each other and before each other. And so, that kind of theory has guided my quest to understand how the subaltern have power dynamics within its group and how that power is fluid. And it also creates an, a different type of resistance. And especially, I'll give you an example. Alexandra, they had a squatters movement, which is being built on a larger squatters movement that James Sofasanke and Panza started in Orlando, which is a Southwestern township in Johannesburg. Well, it spilled over in Alexandra. So these squatters consumed two of the public squares. And so what I said and argued that they created a parallel and alternate community to Alexandra. So they replicated things and they also differed from them. But I also said that the people in Alexandra were the subordinate dominators because they had control of the entries and exits out of the township. And you know, the squatters were in this enclosed space because they had sealed themselves off. You know, they had people having to show IDs to get in. So that that just because I think that resistance is very complex and each group has its own layer of intricacy. And that's part of the search in my work and how I try to write about those complexities and nuances. All right, so I have one final question and then I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, 
who are some of the people in South African history that stand out for you? Wow, do we have time? <laughs> First and foremost, I would like to say Nelson Mandela um, and Winnie Mandela, because without those two and, and all of the foremothers and forefathers that came before them, I would not be writing the history that I am writing. I think that um, having the opportunity to meet some of the struggle heroes has been one of the most joyful highlights of my career and also my path as a scholar. In his classic native life in South Africa, Solomon T. Plati, a prominent ANC leader, editor, journalist, translator, and documentarian made this bold pronouncement. By far the most outrageous of the monstrous crimes that characterized the South African parliament's crusade against law-abiding natives was the passage and enforcement of law number 27 of 1913 under the war hero and the country's first prime minister, Louis Boda, and within three years of a unified republic. Plati's gripping account examines the distress, distressing effects of this parliamentary proclamation by which the South African native awoke this awoke on Friday morning, June 20th, 1913, to find himself not actually a slave, but a pariah in the land of his birth. Acclaimed poet Adelaide Charles Dubé echoes Plati's characterization of Africans by employing the term outcast to describe the liminal space in which they inhabited. Africa, my native land, highlights Dubé's role as an mbongi or a praise poet. In this four piece stanza, the word lyricist and daughter of religious leader James why Tansy educates, extols, and criticizes Africans at the same time. She calls upon the forebearers and upon the glory of another time when Africans had a home on the land that they had traditionally cultivated, settled, and communed. It is, she wrote, it is where our noble ancestors experienced joys of dear ones and of home, where great and glorious kingdoms rose and fell, where blood was shed to save thee thou dearest land ever known. Dubé's account, which colorfully describes a metaphor about the land that drips with images of possession, violence, and mourning, begins in this literary impressionistic way. How beautiful are thy hills and thy dales. I love thy very atmosphere so sweet. The trees adorn the landscape rough and steep. No other country in the world could with thee compare. Rolling hills and lush valleys are set against a landscape littered with swaths of trees and rugged earthen spaces. The beauty and the majesty of the terrain is celebrated and sullied with historical illusions and longing sorrow. Another poet, Nocisi Moncueto, whose own poem describes her as a physically unappealing, a bulky woman with mastic legs, she, she wrote this devastating piece to explain African self-imposed fate. She says, today you're a stranger in Africa. You go about clutching at straws, groom your shield. This land of your forefathers is now the playground of strangers. We perch like birds on branches. Why are the houses of Africans burning? Even a polecat growls in its lair, but a black has nowhere to stay. Through these writings, these South Africans passed down oral traditions about systemic and symbolic violence that impacted generations long after their deaths. So my discussion points today are to talk about violence in the creation and maintenance of white supremacy, why and how black peoples and their allies have deployed violence in liberation struggles. And is violence a legitimate tool in struggles for liberation? Is it a corporeal experience? 
The term symbolic violence was coined by Pierre Bourdieu, a prominent 20th century French sociologist, and it appears in his work as early as the 1970s. And he says that symbolic violence describes a type of non-physical violence manifested in the power differential between social groups. Symbolic violence, he also goes on to say, implies complicit submission on the part of the dominated, which is not the result of a free voluntary act, but rather results from the internalization of an androcentric world vision. Symbolic violence is meant to injure or destroy the recognition of mutual personhood. Now I'm gonna give you another definition, which comes from my colleague at the University of Nebraska, Dr. Lori Dance, in which she says the following, Symbolic violence and just symbolic violence is destructive and disruptive at the level of how or what we blacks and your sup supremacist societies think about ourselves. It is the ability of more powerful groups to get less powerful groups to accept the powerful groups' political agenda, belief systems, narratives, concepts, and so on. I'm going to give you an example of Dance's definition in this poem, also written by Noncisi Munqueto, whom I've already introduced. And it's called We're Stabbing Africa. I'm not going to read all of it, but um, I just want you to just get a gist of it. She goes, This nation rests on the law of the Bible. Traders must forfeit their lives. Turncoats wound it, rip out its lifeblood. Our power wanes and we're ripe for invasion. And she also goes on to say, in this fierce diatribe and we're stabbing Africa, that we split into factions, betray our own people, and Africa leaves as we claw each other. We'd be all at sea if we ruled ourselves. Our cry for self rule is Bapit, Zulu and Kosa, Sutu Swazi, Mfengu, to help other nations. You shun your own people and your desperate quest for honor and status. They gather from you all of our closest secrets. Let me ask you this question. When will it all end? Maqueto qu questions the integrity of Africans whom she believes has sold themselves to the highest political bidder for self gain and for personal acclaim. This push for social and political aspirations betrayed Ubuntu and the collective African humanity it espoused. Africa gets scorned in another way when she talks about how other nations are profiting from you. This is all wrapped up in a type of violence that she talks about started when Europeans came to Table Bay outside of Cape Town and established Cape Town, went to Algoa Bay, they went to Grahamstown, they went to all these places. And she traces the the beginning of the symbolic violence by the origin stories of these Europeans who came into the country. And she implies that social death and the symbolic violence that it produced began the minute the Europeans arrived. And through all this radical demographic and social change, Maqueto and Plati respectively asked the same question. What have they done to so offend God? Or what have they done to deserve this root unsettlement and persecution. Their words echo in more recent times in a struggle song called Sinzani Na, and I'll let you hear a little bit of it. Thank you. 
that song ask over and over again what is our sin is it because our skin is black and if you look at the political violence that was meted out against africans during apartheid which was the strict racial segregation of peoples that lasted from 1948 to 1994. You will see the political violence. And Alvin Feldman writes that political violence is no longer anchored in ideological codes and conditions external to the situation of enactment and transaction. Political enactment becomes sedimented with its own local histories that are mapped out on the template of the body. I'm going to use the example of the 1976 Soweto uprising. As you can see, the map of Soweto, Soweto is an acronym. It actually stands for Southwestern Townships. It was this, it's a sprawling complex of about 20 some townships. And it was established in 1930, and it was part of the Native, Native Urban Areas Act, which was a law that began to urbanize segregation. Here are some photos for you all to look at that shows some of the violence that was meted out by the apartheid regime. Question. How does violence reflect and accelerate some society's experience as an incomplete project or something to be made of? And how is the body staged and commodified by political violence? That's something that Feldman also asked. And how does the cover of night play a role in political violence? And these is just some photographs that you all can see of this revolt. It happened on June 16, 1976. And the reason why it occurred because the government wanted to insist that Africans learn all their classes in Afrikaans, which is the Dutch German derivative language, mostly spoken by the ruling white minority at the time and the so-called colored population. So that meant that all of their subjects, math, science, geography, English, would be taught in Afrikaans. So people stormed out of Morris Isaacson High School in Soweto and led a revolt. And this man is Sam Mazzino. He was the photographer who captured this iconic picture that has been immortalized as the symbol for this uprising. Now, Sam Mazzino, the camera was an extension of his body. While he documented political violence, he was also the victim of symbolic violence. In Zima's internationally acclaimed photograph that came to symbolize the protest after it was published on the front pages of major newspapers around the world, led to his house arrest for 19 months just for taking that picture. Time Magazine listed this iconic photo as the 100 of the most influential images of the time. He would engage in a long protracted battle to get the copyrights to his photograph. And he finally won this battle in 1998. Mind you, that's going back from 1976 to 1998. And he was able to do this while he was still alive. In 2011, Nzema was honored with the Bronze National Order of Inkamanga on Freedom Day in 2001. And this is one of the highest honors. So a veteran journalist named Tommy Nzwai, who worked with Nzema in the 1970s, stated that Nzema was a rare breed of a photojournalist. The camera was an extension of his body. It automatically clicked. The image became a living testimony of what the journalist was writing about because the apartheid police were very quick to deny their acts of brutality. I'm gonna show you a clip of Soweto Blues, which was about this, the uprising. Here's a song that was written for us by Hugh Masekela. He calls it so it is. The children got a letter from their mother. It said no more pasta, do do no more do do. That's when the policeman came. 
Now, Soweto Blues was what I call an oral obituary because it talks about how people died when, rather than how they lived. And it talks about a symbolic violence. And it also brought up Makeba's own Soweto Blues because the inability to bury her mother, loneliness and exile and banishment from South Africa was her social death wrapped in the symbolic violence that she experienced from afar. And here I have presenting to you now is Nightfall in Soweto. It was by Oswald Umbuyir Seni Umtrali. It was a poem that talks about the fear, the agony, the lack of security, the lack of safe, safety at night. He wrote, Nightfall comes like a dreaded disease, seeping through the pores of a healthy body and ravaging it beyond repair. A murderous hand lurking in the shadows, clasping the dagger, strikes down the helpless victim. A murderous hand lurking in the shadow, clasping the dagger, strikes down the helpless victim. Man has ceased to be man. Man has become beast. Man has become prey. I am the prey, I am the quarry to be run down by the marauding beast, let choose by cruel nightfall from his cage of death. So nightfall in Suwetu exemplifies some of the fear that Africans had at nighttime. I'm going to talk about a couple of those fears. One, I'm going to talk about Plati. And Plati, whom I introduced this discussion with, was talking about native life in South Africa. And he document, documents a night among the sufferers where these people have been displaced by the Natives Land Act, where they're told to get off of white farms where they have been squatting. They're now, you know, the roads are flooded and inundated with homeless people. So there's a toddler whose teeth is chattering and, you know, they want to move him and he ultimately dies. And so they use the nighttime to bury this child. So the nighttime is still a question of fear. It is still a question of agony because they did not know if they would have the proper right to mourn or to have that freedom, or would they experience disenfranchised grief, meaning not having the right to grieve? The second example comes from Mark Matavani's book, Kaffa Boy, in which he was talking about having a nightmare and was awakened by his mother. And he says, Perry Irvin, I gasped and stiffen at the name of the dreaded Alexandra police squad. To me, nothing, nothing short of a white man was more terrifying, not even a boogeyman. The noise had risen to a dreadful crescendo. Suddenly, several gunshots rang out in quick succession. Shouts of, follow that Kappa. He can't get far, he's wounded, follow the shots. Someone, it all jolted me back, somehow it all jolted me back into consciousness. 
And I remember where my mother's little black book was. That's the identity document that all Africans had to have on their person. They had the employment details, the residencies, and their ethnicity. So she goes, so his mother creeps out from behind the bedroom door and starts towards the kitchen door on tiptoe. Her last words were to her son as she disappeared behind the shacks and swallowed up by the ominous dark and ominous sounds were, don't forget now, don't ever be afraid. So her figure, he says, like that of a black cloaked ghost, she seemed less of the mother I knew and loved and more of a desperate fugitive fleeing off to her secret lair somewhere in the inky blackness. The next example is the Gaborone raid. This was a raid carried out on June 14, 1985. So I bring this up to discuss how the political violence as well as the symbolic violence was not just germane or contained within South Africa. The South African police force cross international boundaries to carry out their plan to silence critics. So they told everybody in Gaborón to stay in their houses while the raid was executed. The subject of this raid was George Pakle. He had been on the scrutiny of the South African police since the 1970s. And so he, as an ANC activist, ended up moving to Botswana, where Gaborone is, is the capital of Botswana. And he runs a transport business on a hire permit in that country. His wife, Lindy, was a local social worker for the Botswana government. Now, all this destruction you see, can you believe it? There was one survivor, Levi Pakle, George's brother, and he lived to tell the story. And he said this, as soon as they knew that they were being attacked, George and Lindy ran into the bedroom, locked the door, and pushed the portable piano against it. Lindy threw herself face down in a corner. George fell over her as a sign of protection. The piano fell against Levi's bed under which he was hiding. He watched under the bed as they pumped bullets into his brother and his wife. Bullets penetrated them simultaneously, turned them over face upwards. And one asked, is holy dude, are they dead? Moose dude, stone dead, was their reply in English as they had originally stated in Afrikaans. So nightfall was not only in Soweto, but also in Botswana. Now I'm gonna talk about how these examples speak to the body in different ways to show how the body is staged and commodified as political violence. First of all, I'm going to take you back to Mark Matabani example. Now he's going to say this and why his experience aroused sociomatic issues. He wrote, my mother took the candle from my hand and told me to dress. I reached under the kitchen table for my patch khaki shorts and dressed hurriedly. Meanwhile, the pandemonium outside was intensifying with each moment. Each minute, the raid, it seemed, was gathering momentum. Suddenly, a gust of wind puffed through the sackcloth, covering a hole in the window. The candle flickered, but did not go out. I left something warm to soak my groin and trickled down my legs. I tried to stem the flow of urine but by pressing my thighs together, but I was too late. My mother handed me the candle and headed toward the table in the corner. As she went along, he said, without turning to me, take good care of your brother and sister while I'm gone, you hear. Now, George and Lindy is a symbolic one, and it deals with the extension of their house, which is an extension, excuse me, it deals with the extension of, their, of the house 
as the extension of their body. The house, as you can see, once again, was damaged beyond repair. It was proclaimed uninhabitable. All the furniture was bullet damaged. Nothing in the wardrobe was spared by the police. The help of Flora, who survived because she slept out, found her room in shambles. In front of the house in the street stood a damaged bus. In the yard, they found a Honda Ballet, a new one, mind you, which belonged to Lindy, which was burnt out, and a truck had bullet holes all around it. The beetle had bullets pumped into the engine. So what to do all these stories have together? These stories on symbolic and political violence create a genealogy of the dead, which is based on oral, oral history, local history, biography, interviews, autobiographies, poems, and oral obituaries. The cartography consists of the following, imprints of the past on today's footprint. Adelaide Charles Dubé's Africa, My Native Land makes this very clear when the poet writes, despair of thee, I never will struggle. I must for freedom, God's gift, gift God's great gift, till every drop of blood within my vein shall dry upon my troubled bones. A passage found in women writing Africa, the Southern African region, provides the best summation for the meaning and further contextualization of, of Adelaide Charles Dubé's profound metaphorical words. She it states, the reference to my troubled bones marks allegiance to an ancestral religion, alluding to the importance of burial in one's own home ground and to the rupture between the ancestors and their offspring through the alienation of the land. The metaphor and the analogy represents the fortification of the body and the disintegration of the corpse and the realm in which the spirits reside. Bones the bones and the land encode the people's DNA, the molecules that fertilize the planetary energies that guide and support the universe and its spiritual language, which she deciphers in this forceful assault. In Mama Africa, Langston, Langston writes in another poem this, closing my eyes, I can still see the red earth burning, burning under the ancient sky. Goodbye, no, not ever. Your course through my veins and my blood, the color of the clay mud that shapes so many vessels. Africa, my mother who prepared me for life's journey. Mama Africa, mother to whom I shall return when this journey is done. The body as these poets convey renders itself not whole because the historic past and the contemporary present where land restitution remains a hot unfulfilled issue in South Africa so much so that Adelaide Charles Dubé's bones keep rattling with them in the 21st century. And in the last example, I'm going to talk about the body as a forensic archive. And this example is of Titi Machinini, and he was the leader of the Soweto uprising. And he would ultimately go into exile after the uprising, he would come in and out of Soweto dressed as a woman to see his parents. And then he eventually left and settled in Guinea in West Africa. Now his mother, Virginia Machinini, received a letter that stated her son had died due to natural causes during the night. Here we go, nightfall, night. It argues fear, agony, pain. But the problem was when the corpse came back to South Africa, they found discrepancies, they found issues. First of all, there were wounds all over his body, mainly behind his ear. He had a big wound. Three weeks after his death, he was still bleeding. The right eye seemed to have fallen in it. It was a hole there and the other one was swollen. Several bruises on the face, which shows he was brutally murdered. The story recounted by Mashinini's mother is what I call, again, an oral obituary. It talks about how the deceased died rather than how they lived. She performed a visual autopsy, noting the deformities on his body, the vessel violently turned into a corpse. In many ways, his body represents another element of nightfall in metaphorical terms because earthly light brought darkness upon his mauled body. Mastanini's soul now becomes part of the lineage of terror as it 
transition from earth to the spiritual world on insecure, fearful, and violent grounds. Um, Charlie Spawn supports this conclusion as this line in Nightfall suggests or asks, where is my refuge? Where is Titi Mashanini's refuge? Where is Brianna Taylor's refuge? Where is Trey Bonds Martin's refuge? And then Twali goes, he, he provides some answers. He goes, not in my matchbox house where I barricade my, myself against nightfall. In Mashanini's case, his violent death does not rest, allow, does not rest, and does not allow his spirit to rest in the ground, which swallows up his physical being and repatriates him in Africa, his native land, simply because Adelaide Charles Dubé's bones, again, are still rattling until her people and the symbolic and political violence that they endured is cosmologically satisfied. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Curry. That was awesome. Let's see, we do have a question in the Q&A. Hold on just a minute. Okay, so uh, what resources were used to cultivate all of this historical information and how long did it take? Wow, you know, I've been, I've been studying this country for over 20 some years now, you know, so I have, quite quite an archive in my head but also i look at if i was to teach an undergrad on how to look for sources i look at the back of people's books the bibliographies you know i also read everything i can get on about south africa and i try to employ the, my training through an interdisciplinary method so I'm not just a historian. I was trained in geography, political science. You know, I took art history and that comes through and I believe in what I presented to you tonight. And I see value in capturing the voices of Africans. And that is my, one of my main objectives as a scholar, because I do not want to go and recolonize the African continent with my voice. I want their voice to tell the story in their own words. And in many ways, when I was doing research in Alexandra, I was in Alexandra walking on foot, taking the public taxis, the minivan taxis. I took a South African around Alexandra and people were speaking to me as if I was the indigenous person and she was the foreigner. I say that to say that Alexandra is reputed to be very um, crime ridden. You know, people don't go there, but I walked all over. I learned so much that way. You know, I go back and visit people while I'm in South Africa. And you know that you made an impression on people when you go back and see them and they say, oh, you've gotten fat. I'm like, you don't have to tell me that. So, you know, I take that as a compliment, right? Because they see me as one of their own. And that's very important to me as a scholar. All right. And I see that uh, in the chat that people are appreciating you bringing in the, the poetry and the music because it adds a, a, another level or another depth to the story. Yes, um, I didn't show, if anyone wants to look at this later, I didn't show the film about Sam and Zima and that um, iconic photograph. And you know, during my first year in South Africa, I was on a pre-dissertation fellowship and I was in Soweto and he happened to be there. So I actually have a picture of him standing in front of that portrait. Unfortunately, he passed away um, in 2018 when I was in South Africa at the age of 83. But it's meeting people like him and Peter Magabani, who was another important photographer that made me want to just not, well, let me put it this way, maybe want to incorporate different sources. Everything tells the story. And when you look at that iconic photograph, you see Hector Peterson, that's the, that's the lifeless body. And 
in Buya's arms and his sister is wailing alongside him. That is pretty powerful, you know, and that of itself speaks many languages to be interpreted. So I try to pay honor to, to people, you know, if someone takes the time to uh, allow me to do an interview and make sure I incorporate their voice. I felt like my first book, people told me what to write. You know, like I was just the medium, but they were the spirits God in me. All right, so there's another question in the Q&A and it is one I, I, I kind of wrote this down in my notes. Um, the term oral obituary is new to me. Thank you for sharing it today. Can you speak to how oral obituaries evolved, if at all, after the end of apartheid? I'm, I'm presuming there was more openness. Okay, I coined that term oral obituary, okay. So my first book, Apartheid on a Black Isle, chapter five, deals with the Soweto uprising. I was trying to find a way to talk about this mass movement that lasted for a year and a half differently than previously done. So as I was reading interviews from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has its online archive, people were talking about the activities that the deceased did before they died. You know, like one person, you know, talked about her son drinking tea or playing soccer. So I, was, I started seeing all of this cross-referencing. So I said, hmm, they're talking about how people died rather than how they live. So I am theorizing in the piece I'm working on now, um, I divided it into three different phases. Sunrise is when they become, were born, when they become politically baptized. And then there's this gray area I'm trying to come with a name for, but the last phase is called sunset. Like when they die, what happens to their body? You know, what are some of their last words, right? And how, do that, how does that get interpreted into the obituary? We're so used to obituaries talking about, you know, Miss Deborah Hurd, you know, was a member of the NAACP, you know, from 1960 to 1970. What I'm saying is we need to talk about the obituary as if we are decoding the deceased's last minutes on earth and in their transition to the next phase of life. So it's really interesting that you brought that up because that made me think as I was coming up with your flyer and I was looking for a quote to go along with it, I ended up uh, using something from Stephen Biko and reading about how he died, you know, the, the beating and, you know, they were trying to say, oh, he wasn't, he wasn't injured. We didn't injure him in prison. Uh, you know, of course he was shackled and he was naked and, you know, so it really, that oral obituary and the body as a forensic archive, because you know his family and people were saying, "No, look at all, look at all these these injuries to him. He wasn't just he didn't fall. You know his exactly. his body tells the story of how he died. Exactly, and that's another reason why I got into the death and the analysis of resistance, because what I didn't tell you is. During the apartheid era, they prohibited people from having funerals or they inhibited them from having funerals. So, you know, they could be at the gravesite and here come these big trunk trucks, you know, these huge tanks, and they're going to emit tear gas and disrupt the funerary process. So I was like, where, what do they do when they have disenfranchised grief, right? What do they do when they don't have the right to publicly mourn? So that's why I came up with oral obituaries. That's what they're doing now, right? Those testimonies are part of that mourning, right? And so, you know, in Biko, they put him on a truck in the dead of winter, naked, and transported him hours, hours. And he's supposed to jump or you know beat himself up hang himself 
all of the misinformation about you know his body and what what also got me about this whole episode about death is that the government would tell you what you could write on the tombstone and how long you could mourn for instance mickey mouse was from 1 to 1 30 donald duck from 1 30 to 2 o'clock so that's i was like oh my god they they were just speaking to me you know what do the parents do one the first thing they did they would go and try to reclaim the body okay we claimed the body they would go to the morgue they would go to the police station they would go to the anc house they would go to different places or as i also argue in this chapter they would visit the sites of death now so when they go and visit the sites of death they go there to tell the spirit we are taking you back home because you see it goes it goes back to what i've been talking about you have to have a satisfied cosmological order and that's what they were doing and those were some of the things that i saw how they navigated around the apartheid regime which was by the way ubiquitous they had informers you know they had all kinds of surveillance but re resistance did go on so i wanted to pick back up because you said something that i had written down as a question and it's like okay that's perfect um, because when you were talking about um, the, the the boy in uh, native life in South Africa, how they had to bury him in the middle of the night. And so that made me think of you talking about symbolic violence, but, but the symbolic violence that I thought of was that he's not getting the rituals of death. So, you know, in order for him to pass over and have a good passive, I mean, first of all, his death wasn't a good death anyway, because he, he died, you know, from exposure. But then it's like, on top of that, he doesn't get the rituals that allow his spirit to pass over. So there's a whole other level of symbolic violence that's going on, isn't there? Exactly. You hit it on the head. Exactly. I mean, you've got people hurrying up a, a, a home going, you know? and looking over their shoulders, not being able to relax. But, you know, like I said, that carried over with the apartheid regime too. You know, you know, people couldn't even have after tears parties, that's what they call, they gather people's homes and celebrate the deceased. So yeah, it's, you know, just talking to you now, I'm seeing more of the continual theme of this and I need to go back and, you know, delve a little bit more into this, you know, and some of um, the bodies uh, of the children, there was one had a letter to Nelson Mandela, um, you know, one mother talked about, she had witnessed, now one mother had witnessed her son's head being pummeled against a rock, but she didn't know it was him. Then she found out. One, another mother, she comes home from work because the township is a square mile at this time, right? It's very densely populated, right? The fire was, smoke was everywhere, right? So she left the quote unquote safety of the white suburbs to go home and check on her children. And she saw every, you know, flames and people saluting her with the black power salute. And then the children, Philip, Philip March's friends, Took, their took his mother to the site where he got shot. And so when he was on his deathbed, he got shot on June 18th. That's when the Soweto uprising took on over to Alexandra. And Alexandra and some Alexandrians were going to school in Soweto because Alex didn't have a high school. So you got a little bit of that uh, cross migration. So he said, you know, talking about Afrikaans, you know, being the instruction of classes, he said the Boers, that's what the Afrikaners or the white uh, minority were called, the Boers, which is word means farmers, they will get their chance, they will get their time. He goes, how would I like it if I'm in the 12th grade or 11th grade or 10th grade and I have to learn a foreign language, another language? And so he, even though as a so-called colored, he had some privileges because colored 
were the buffer between white and black, he stood in solidarity with Africans who were being told that they had to learn Afrikaans. Also, that would put them off of school for a year or so, you know. Parents had to come up with the school fees. So they were fighting for all of that economics, you know, um, freedom. You know, they wanted English because English was an international language. It was the language of, they saw as liberation. So, yeah, I mean, those testimonies were so intriguing. So I have a section called first words and last words, and I'm going to prepare them and talk about them and how they relate to the phases of the eulogies of death that I've outlined for you with the sunrise and the sunset. Now, I may need some help in the middle, so I may call on you, you know, talk over some ideas. Um, so I, I wondered if you could go back to kind of um, flesh out some more for us the, the, the distinction of uh, Lori Dance's definition of symbolic violence as opposed to Bordeaux's version of symbolic violence and how that applies in, in the context of say Alexandra or, or maybe even the Soweto out, uprising. Well, it all relates to power, right? Symbolic and the, the impact upon the body because the body becomes a tool for the state to harm, right? I mean, you, you got uh, Matabani urinating on himself. It's psychosomatic. You know, that's why Steve Biko said that the problem is, you know, the oppressed are not free because their mind is not free, which is why he believed everybody that was oppressed was black, you know, and he was talking about, you gotta free yourselves. And so I think that Bordeaux, and let me complicate, you know, symbolic violence, also the impact of symbolic, symbolic violence that I didn't talk about was with the infiltrators, right? People that were seen as sellouts or collaborators with the government. So they were engaged in their own retribution, right? For these people. And it was called necklacing. So necklacing is when you take a tire or, and you put it around a person's neck and you light it up. But you see, we have been conditioned or they were conditioned right, to see or to join people that really didn't have their best interests. And so in order to save themselves, they had to kill their own. So I'm not, so I'm just, I'm not saying that symbolic violence does not happen with the subaltern and they do not create it themselves. But as Winnie Mandela was said, when she was accused of being involved in a death of a youth, she said, there was a war, there are casualties in war. But I will say she was exonerated from that. But unfortunately, it was two days after she died. So I, I mean, the symbolic violence is what we go through in the United States every day, being black in a, you know, driving a, a, a decent car, you know, it doesn't, have to physically harm you, but it psychologically does the trick. And I think that's the difference that dance brings out that Bordeaux doesn't. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? <laughs> oh, my colleague is gonna ask me a question. Let's see. Okay, so we do have one. Um, what is happening now after so many years of struggle in South Africa, politically, socially, and economically? Whew. Do we have, I don't think we have enough time. Basically, I'm going to sum it up with these words. Economic power is in the, in the hands of a few Black elites. The white minority still controls the economy, okay? People are still wanting decent homes people are still wanting land returned. That's why Dubé's 
bones are still rattling, you know. You know, South Africans have been engaged in some really good student movements recently. The fallism movement, you know, against the rising cost of school fees, right? The taken down of the monument of Cecil John Rhodes, who's the, the great diamond entrepreneur who wanted to build a Cape to Cairo route. And they also joined the global Black Lives Matter movement as well and invoked George Floyd's name and brought the attention to other African Americans who died violently by the hands of the police. And they also, they bring in another element to the Black Lives Matter, and that is the so-called colored population. Because in South Africa, it's not just about Black and white. It's about this group that was created when indigenous people intermingled and had sexual relations with European settlers like the Dutch, right? So it's very complex, but it's, you know, it's really understanding how Pan-Africanism or pain rather is a form of Pan-Africanism that unfortunately unites us, right? You know, because that's part of the systemic racism that we have been dealt with and has occurred. So, but there, you know, culturally, you know, the country is vibrant. The music scene is great. I love the jazz. Uh, I love the hip hop. And um, yeah, it's a very, very beautiful country. And I'm glad that I get to see their television programs on Netflix. And I get to see or hear their languages spoken. And, you know, every time I get home for, homesick for South Africa, I don't care how many times I've watched it. I watched the Kings of Johannesburg again, How to Ruin Christmas, Blood <laughs> and Water. You know, I'll, I'll go back to some of my videos that I took at the jazz club that I used to hang out with at, and I have a South African night. So, South Africa is really very much a part of me, even though I was born in the United States. It's, it's, you know, I no longer have friends that I have family, you know, 20 some years of going and they give me a hard time. Like I give them a hard time, you know, <laughs> and I joke and I said, you know, my mama is so sarcastic and she, they go, hello, where do you think you get it from? <laughs> <laughs> So I look forward to, to being with them because to me, that's the only time, honestly, my spirit feels rested. And you know, as you were talking about the music, uh, someone introduced me to the soil. Yes. I love the soil. They are just, oh my gosh, they're so awesome. Uh, but yeah. Um, but you I'm know, gonna I'm gonna put a whole list of artists in in your email. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> and then we'll have to share it. <laughs> yes, we'll we'll have to post it on our on our website. Uh, okay, Dr. Curry's South African song list. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so going back to the question that that we, you just answered, though, it also really made me think about. Uh, going back to talking about Winnie Mandela, because, you know, that was her push. She was like, until there is land redistribution, and we talk about redistributing wealth, we're not really doing anything. You know, this is just a farce. This democracy is a farce until we have those types of, you know, redistributions. So, yeah, um, there, there is a lot. What do you think... Um, the chances or the opportunities for African Americans and South Africans to work together on some of these issues. I mean, because a lot of the issues that they have, um, we have here, and and you know, it's just a different form of it because. They're in their own country marginalized. And we're in a country where we're a minority marginalized. But the, the political violence and the social and economic, some of those things are, are the same amongst. So, so what are the opportunities there for us to kind of 
at least think together and talk together about how we work on that. One, we need to travel to each other's countries, you know, so we can see firsthand what is actually going on on the ground. There's a lot uh, about 4,000 African Americans who have moved to South Africa permanently. And I think also, I think music is the greatest um, language for us to translate this pain or to translate the struggle, to translate the history. And so I think as we allow South Africans to share their culture, I think we would get a better opportunity to learn more about them and the history and the different history and the different narratives that have woven together to create their uniqueness, their nuances and their complexity. You know, um, I was never so excited when I was on um, listening to Sirius XM and it was a whole jazz section with nothing about South Africa. I think it's on Sunday nights and I got to hear one of my favorite radio personalities here in South Africa. I mean, you know, and because normally when I was in South Africa for that year, every Sunday, my friends say from 10 to 1, Dawn is on lockdown because I would be in the studio. Um, I was in the studio filming and, you know, while she's on air and, you know, the jazz would be great. And I would have my journal and I would just write. It was so soothing. I think I ended up writing three journals before I left South Africa for that year. I think that we need to probably talk to each other. You know, there's, there's misconceptions about African-Americans and Africans from all over the continent. And I think dialogue is the first thing. And then from there, we can hopefully build other things, you know. All right, so we are at time. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Curry. This has been just wonderful. Uh, before we leave, I wanted to share our next event, which will be next Thursday. Dr. Andy Eisen, a visiting professor at Stetson University, co-director of the Community Education Project. He will be talking about uh, the project that he is working on with some incarcerated men at a Florida prison. And they're doing this really groundbreaking historical research on uh, recovering the identity of enslaved people during, at, during the period of Spanish colonialism of Florida. So uh, these men are incarcerated. They don't have access to the internet. They only recently got access to computers. So he's ha he has to like photocopy for them, but they're doing all of this work uh, and it's just amazing. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, again, we want to thank Dr. Curry for her wonderful presentation. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cynthia Robinson, who should still be on here. She is the chair of Department of Black Studies. Uh, we also have, uh, there she's still on here, uh, Amy Schindler, who's the director of the Archives and Special Collections, who's also a partner in our 50th anniversary event. So we want to thank you all for being here. And everyone have a good night. Thank you all. Thank you, Deborah.